And that will concern magnetic impurities, and that will also bring us uh, to another very interesting phenomenon in condensator physics called the Condor effect, which I'm going to briefly describe. Uh, and then today I'm going to move on to another class of topological materials, which again uh, has many interesting uh, properties, and they are called topological insulators. Okay, so uh, that's the plan for today, and I'm going to see how much I can go on with topological insulators in two days. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just begin. So um, to start with, let me just say what is Kondo effect. Uh, Kondo effect is a uh, is an effect that emerges out of uh, interaction of a metallic substrate with a magnetic impurity. What happens is that if you have a metal, it has a conduction band with a lot of electrons, and then you put a magnetic impurity. And by magnetic impurity, what I mean is that the spin, this impurity is an atom with a definite spin, and that spin interacts with the spin of the conduction electrons through a S dot S interaction. So you see that if uh, Psyche uh, denotes the you know, annihilation operator for fermions, then uh, this psi dagger sigma psi uh, divided by a half in units of h bar equal to one is just a spin operator for the electrons and it can point in an arbitrary direction. So there is a sigma vector out here. And that spin has a s dot s interaction with the spin of the impurity. Okay, so that's the meaning of this term. And since the spin is local, it's at a given site, and therefore, if I look at these electrons in momentum space, I have sum over all momenta uh, because you know the Fourier transform of any ultra local quantity involves sum over momenta, all of momenta. So, uh, this electrons has a uh, momentum index which is k because these are uh, they have momentum in uh, eigenstates, and there is a spin index which is alpha which can take up and down. And of course, uh, you know, that's, uh, so and this psi, okay, which doesn't have the spin index, is a two component field, it's psi up and psi down. So that's the way it uh, works. So now, you see that uh, this kind of thing is not, uh, you know, it's not unknown. I mean, people have been looking at this in 60s. And, uh, oh, one more thing that I uh, have to say is that uh, this spin, that you put in has to be a quantum spin. That is, S must satisfy the standard commutation relation of uh, quantum spins. Okay. So, uh, and this can be a spin S in general. Okay. Could be a spin half, could be a spin one, uh, whatever you want. Now the question that Anderson asked, and this was following some paper by Kondo, who showed that there is something very anomalous about this kind of coupling of uh, in, in quantum impurity spin with an electron spin, the question that he asks is that what happens as we lower the temperature, okay, or equivalently energy? So what happens to the, this system at low energy? Now, of course, today, when people look into this, they do what is called a perturbative renormalization group approach. So what they do is that they, they lower the energy just a little bit, okay, and then they say, well, because I have lowered this energy, you know, in the new energy scale, I have a new Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian, according to this RG flow, must have the same form as the original Hamiltonian, that is this, and but with renormalized coefficient, so that lambda will change. Okay, so that's the general uh, philosophy of RG. So what Affleck so this is there given in Affleck's review, and there, this is a reference that I'm sending you over. But the point is that if you do this procedure, what you find is that the rate at which this lambda changes, okay, is given by a quantity which is negative. Okay. Now, for those of you who know about uh, field theory and beta functions and stuff like this, this essentially means that the theory has a negative beta function. Okay, so what does that mean in layman's language? It means that as you lower the energy, 
this lambda is going to increase. It's going to become more and more important. The coefficient is going to become more and more important at low energies. Okay. Now, people who know about this negative beta function knows that having a negative beta function for any theory essentially means that it has asymptotic freedom. That is, it is decoupled at high energy scales and very strongly coupled at low energy scales. Okay. So this is something that we routinely see in the theory of strong interactions where this kind of things happen. But Anderson essentially in his own way, he didn't really do an RG, but he did something which he called Poorman scaling, okay, which is precursor of RG in some sense. But he figured out this brilliant piece of physics that you know, as you increase the sorry, as you decrease the energy scale, this coupling is going to become more and more important. So and this was a paper which was some Journal of Physics in 1970, and this is really two years before, I think it's two to three years before uh, the concept of negative beta function in the context of high energy physics came in. And uh, okay, so uh, you know this is one of the first areas where you saw asymptotic freedom without really realizing that it is asymptotic freedom. But in any case, okay, so if you solve this equation, but D is a standard energy scale, okay? Um, we find that lambda effective D is given by this quantity. And therefore, at D, which is an energy scale which then gives you a temperature scale, uh, when that hits this D naught times one by mu lambda naught, okay? And this mu is a constant which depends on the density of these fermions at the Fermi energy. You see that this coupling diverges. This divergence of coupling means that you cannot do your parametric theory anymore. So all your predictive power stops there, but it certainly signifies that the initial metallic state of fermions that you have is unstable to the presence of this coupling. That is, this is an instability. Okay. This instability essentially is like a crossover. Okay, it's called a condo crossover. So below this stable instability scale, you have a new ground state where, the, where it turns out what Anderson so showed is that the impurity scheme uh, spin gets completely screened by the spin of the electrons around it. So in the condo state at low energy, if you try to measure the spin of the impurity, you are going to get zero because the electrons around it, you know, so let's say that the spin is up. And then my electrons around it is going to get many spin down so that we are going to form a singlet with this impurity spin. And if you try to measure the spin of that system, you're going to get a zero. At high energy, of course, this screening doesn't work because this coupling is not strong enough and you get a half spin for the impurity. Okay, so this difference essentially signifies crossover to a new phase, which is called the condo phase. And this screening is known as the on the screen. So this was, you know, beautifully pointed out by Anderson in his 1970 paper. And later, of course, people understood it in the language of denormalization group. Uh, but uh, this is the on the physics for you. Okay. So uh, let me just go ahead. But yeah, so another way. Okay, but before I go into this, any questions regarding this? So, so uh, Krishnan, just a quick question. Maybe this is, I, I just saw the next slide briefly, but this might be uh, there in the next slide. But so, so here, uh, the, the spins of the, in the, in the condo phase, the spins are all uh, pointing in the same direction. So it becomes, is it some kind of a metal ferromagnet transition or what is the nature uh, of the no, state? No, it's, a, it's a very local thing, Krishnan. So I what see. happens is that, if you have a single impurity, and we are talking only about sing, single impurity here, okay. okay, it's only at the neighborhood of that the spins roughly point in the same direction. Okay. 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 So, but far away from this, you are not going to see anything different. Okay. Um, okay. So, so if you do a transport measurement on this, you will still see some metallic property. Then you will see metallic property, but transport. Uh, I mean, you are going to see that uh, you know. So, I'm going to talk about HCM transport a little bit. Okay. You're going to see that there is signature of this condo phase. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Anything which is unclear? 
Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, my doubt is, uh, what is this parameter D that you're differentiating with respect to? Oh, I'm sorry. So this D is essentially the energy scale, okay, which you are loading. Okay. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay. So essentially, you start with an energy scale D naught, which could be your band energy scale, and then uh, when you when you lower the energy and you hit a scale D, which is like the condo temperature, which is much smaller compared to D. Oops, sorry, which is much smaller compared to D, okay? Uh, sorry, D naught. Uh, then you hit this condo phase. So this is really the energy that you lower as you do your RG. Okay, this is also the energy scale up to which your effective theory is valid. Okay, so as you lower that energy scale, you get a more effective, more and more effective low energy theory, and that's where uh, you know the, that's the way this RG is done. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Fine. If not, let's try to look into this in a slightly more physical way. Which again, Anderson came up with a model where you don't really have an isolated spin. But you have two species of electron, and one of them is an d orbital electron. So as you know, that you know when you have these d orbital electrons, they are pretty localized electrons which doesn't move much. They are not like you know standard s wave electrons which form conduction bands and stuff like that. Okay? So Anderson thought that maybe one way to sort of take, uh, understand this effect is to think of taking a d electron. Okay, which is a single electron in a D shell out here, and that is coupled to a conduction electron so because the electron from this D shell can hop into the conduction band of the metal, and electron from the conduction band can also hop into this D shell. But the D shell can be occupied if the D shell is occupied. Of course, it cannot be occupied by two spin up electrons due to Pauli principle, but it can be occupied by a spin up and spin down. But if that happens, then you have a strong energy cost, which is you, okay, an on-site Hubbard debulsion. So, and of course, this uh, conduction band has some energies. Okay? So, what Anderson did is that uh, the first thing is that um, people later showed, okay, but this was not during Anderson's work, but people later showed that if you put this U to be really, really large, so that you can ignore the double occupancy of this uh, level, then this model is absolutely the same, at least at low energy, as the, uh, the Pondo model, or the model of this impurity spin interacting with the heat. Okay. So uh, these two models are roughly similar, but this model, where you have this d orbital electron and the impurity electron, that gives us a very nice way to analyze this. And this analysis comes from writing down a variational wave function for this system. So if you look into this system, you can think of what are the possible low energy phases of this system. One thing that you can have is that the conduction electron is completely occupied up to the Fermi level. And then the d electron, uh, the d orbital level is empty. Okay. So that's given by the state zero. That's my ground. That's my uh, you know one of the possible ground state where the d orbital is empty and the conduction electron is essentially uh, you know completely filled up to the Fermi. But then you could also have a single electron in this d shell, okay? Because that doesn't got much of much of energy, and the reason is that uh, you know you don't really require e. So if you have a strong Q, your low energy state, whatever they are, must have either zero or one occupation, uh, must have occupation either zero or one of the D wave orbit. Okay. You cannot have an occupation two width up and down because that's going to really cost you a very strong, a very high energy. Okay. So what you did is to take an state which has zero occupation, sorry, which is zero occupation of this d orbital, and which has a single occupation of this d orbital and a hole at the Fermi surface, uh, because an electron from this Fermi surface can hop in into the d orbital. 
and humidal linear superposition of these two uh, wave functions. Okay? And that's the variational wave function. And since the hole from the Fermi surface can pop from any k, so there are these alpha k parameters and the alpha zero parameters, which are your variational wave function parameters. And then, as with any variational wave function, what he did is to compute the acceptation value of the Hamiltonian in this variational state, which gives you this. Okay, so uh, this is really simple. All you have to do is to take this Hamiltonian and take its expectation value in Simon. And that's a straightforward thing. So, for example, you know, um, let me just not get into the details of this, but I mean, if you just do this, you can see that uh, you know it's a real straightforward stuff. And then what you do, you minimize your variational energy. That's also standard. That's how you calculate uh, things from variational energy. And so here you minimize it with respect to alpha k for a given k and alpha naught. Okay. And this gives you these two equations. So when you solve this for alpha naught and alpha k, and you put it back in this energy expression, you find a very simple energy expression which is given by this e tilde. Now, what is this e tilde? This e tilde happens to be the wave function, the energy of the d orbital plus some delta k, which occurs because of the interaction of this d orbital with the hole in the conduction band. Remember that uh, this d, remember that whenever the d orbital is occupied, you have a hole in the conduction band, okay? Because an electron from the conduction band hops into this d orbital, okay? And therefore, uh, this is given by uh, delta. Now, if that is the case, okay, clearly you have a bound state between the electron in the d orbital and this hole in the conduction band if this delta k is negative. Okay, so you define it like this, and then you do a calculation and you indeed show that this delta k turns out to be negative, which means that at low enough energies, the ground state essentially shows that the d orbital electron, if occupied, is tied, you know, it forms a bound state with a hole in the conduction band, and therefore any spin of that electron is going to be screened because of this. Okay. And also notice that it doesn't form a uh, it doesn't form a bound state with a single electron at definite momentum k. It form, forms a bound state with many such momentum and many such electrons in such a way that uh, you know this thing is screened, the spin is screen. Okay, so essentially that is the physics. That's how the screening takes place. And what is the signature of that? The signature of this is that if you calculate the density of state or the number expectation of this d orbital, it's not it's now not one anymore. Okay. So it turns out that this one minus n d is a finite number. That is, you know, it is a little bit different from one, and that difference shows up uh, in, as an extra density of state of the conduction electrons. Because you know the total density of state of the conduction electron on the d level must be a constant because electrons have to be somewhere. It cannot just move arbitrarily. Okay, it cannot just go out of the sample. However, uh, there is a transfer of density of state, a spectral weight as you call it, from the d orbital to the conduction electron, and that extra density of state can be picked up if you uh, try to measure density of state by some external probe, and STM does the job. Okay. So if you take an STM T and put it near this D wave orbital, you are going to see a D for a peak. Okay. And this, in, this therefore, this condo effect leads to a signature in STM. Because the density of state at the conduction electron changes by a small amount, and that small amount is picked up by STM. So if you compare an um, STM spectra of a system where there is the condo ground state, and with the STM spectra of the normal metal, except for without the impurity, you're going to see a small bump. Okay. And that bump essentially shows that you have had a transfer of density of state from the d orbital to the conduction. Okay. 
this typically shows up in an STM. It can show up in either as a dip or a peak, but it's different from a flat line. And why it can show up for a, as a dip or a peak is something which is detailed of STM physics. And you know, it has a simple explanation, but I'm not going to get into the details. Okay. So, so essentially, the statement is that this condo effect leads to a deviation of unit filling of the D level and therefore gives a small excess density of state of the metallic electrons at the finding surface, which can be picked up by yeast. Now that's the signature of this condo effect for, uh, you know, for uh, electrons. So, any question regarding this? See, this is a very simple variation and calculation which people can, you know, sort of sit down and toy around with. Uh, and uh, this gives you this uh, typical prediction that there would be a bump in the esteem state. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, can you please again connect it to the condo effect and the D electron that you pick? There's, these are two different effects, right? In condo effect, we have a magnetic no, infinity. No, it's and not. So, as I said, you know, I haven't shown this, but as I said, that in the limit of large U, where you exclude double occupancy of the D orbital, if you try to take this Hamiltonian and do some technical stuff for the Schiffer transformation, okay, you get back the condo Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian essentially at low energy can be replaced by the condo Hamiltonian, which acts as an effective Hamiltonian at that uh, level. Uh, also, sir, here the D electron is really played by the role of the impurity, right? In this case. Absolutely, the spin of the D electron plays the role of the impurity spin. Okay. Sir. Okay. So you see that essentially what happens is that um, the D. So since you are not allowing for uh, two uh, a double occupation of the D orbital, what happens is that uh, you know you always allow for either a spin or nothing. Okay. You do not allow for a singlet between two electrons sitting in the D. Okay, so if the spin is to be screened, it has to be screened by electrons from the conduction part. Well, that's the condo physics. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions regarding this? So, uh, Krishnito, just a quick question about how important is that in the condo effect the interaction be somewhat local in position space? As in, if you have a magnetic uh, impurity in, let's say, ultra cold atoms or something, you might have even like fairly long range interaction with the magnetic impurity. Yes. Would you still so, get some yeah. version of this effect or is uh, it? Very no, so the point is that, look, I mean, if you have a system, where you directly have a magnetic impurity sitting at the top of conduction electrons, you know, then you are done. I mean, you don't have okay. to consider any other models or anything like that. Okay. But when Anderson was first looking into this, this thing was not the thing they were looking into. They were looking into physics of uh, a class of materials where there are some D wave, uh, D electron orbitals uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and some conduction band, you know. And then they were trying to see if uh, you could have this condo type of physics out here. But in the process, what comes out is a very nice variation of calculation. Okay. okay. Which gives you an explanation for the screening in some sense. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any questions? Okay. If not, okay. So this was a standard picture of condo effect. So what? To, uh, so I'm just going to tell you what the deviations are. So, for example, in doing this condo effect, what uh, condo and also Anderson assume is that the density of state around the Fermi energy is a constant. Now, this is a very, very, very good assumption for a standard three-dimensional metal because, as you know, that uh, the density of states around uh, the Fermi energy of a three-dimensional metal is an absolute constant. Okay, so as long as you are in any foreseeable energy scale. I mean, it is more or less a constant. Very nice. However, if it turns out that the system uh, has a different density of state, for example, if the density of state vanishes at the Fermi surface as e to the power r, 
to give this energy to the power r and remember why i'm saying this the reason i'm saying this is that we have seen this in graphing if you in the graphing when you come to the dirac point the density of state goes with power r equal to 1 okay so the statement is that the, uh, which was later shown by inglers and um, many others is that if this r becomes greater than half that is if the density of state vanishes as you approach the fermi point or the dirac point with a power greater than half then there can be no conductor screening and the reason is that at low energy you don't really have enough electron available electron states to screen the conduction uh, to screen the uh, conductor screen however for r less than half if the uh, density of state vanishes uh, slowly it is possible to have a condo effect but this requires a finite strength of the condo coupling that is the lambda okay what we call j here uh, previously you see that uh, the way we looked into this the condo coupling can occur the so they can have a finite temperature if you have a sizable density of state for very very small lambda however in the case where this density of state is not a constant what they showed is that uh, the condo phase can of course occur but you have to have a certain interaction strength and the way to understand this is that you need to interact more strongly because now you have lesser number of available electrons to screen the uh, condo screen okay so there is a phase transition between at r equal to half above this there is no condo phase and below this there is a condo phase provided that the interaction is strong okay so this is one deviation what happens when you don't have a constant density of state at the fermi energy the other deviation is much more subtle and in some sense much more interesting so what later people saw is that uh, when i looked into these electrons you know i just thought that there is one species of electrons which is in the conduction band but think of a multi band system which do not talk to each other but each of them talk to the impurity separately so if you have an electron in band 1 which interacts with the impurity you can have electron in band 2 which interacts with the impurity you can have an electron in band 3 which interacts with the impurity and so but now so each of these bands constitutes an electron channel because it has a different index okay so we are going to call it a channel we can call it a band as well i mean no no problem there but in that case what happens is that now you have k electron bands or channels to screen an impurity which has seen s okay the question is what happens to the ground state and the answer to this is very very interesting the answer to this is that if k by 2 and this by 2 comes because each channel uh, contributes a spin half is larger than s that is if you have more number of bands uh, uh, then you need to uh, then uh, the value of s okay so if for example s is half and if there are more than one band okay the impurity is said to be over So, which means that your electron screen the impurity, but there is some left. Okay, so that's over screening. And if you have s greater than k by two, that's called under screening, and it is optimally screened if s is equal to k by two. So the phenomenon that we discussed earlier corresponds to s equal to half and k equal to one. That is, you have one channel of electrons and a screen of impurity. Now, so you could have a spin one impurity and two channels, and it's going to be the same. Okay. Now, what Affleck and others showed using some very fancy, uh, you know, uh, boundary conformal field theory techniques, which of course I'm not going to get into the details of. Uh, what he showed is that you could ask this following question: Without the impurity spin. that one the ground state of this conduction electrons was of course a fermi liquid right it's a standard three dimensional system now with this spin is the ground state you call this screening and whatever you have is it still a fermi liquid and the answer to that turned out is that if the spin is optimally screened or under screened then the condo ground state is a fermi liquid okay 
so if you measure the specificity of that state or any global property of that state, you are going to see that you get whatever uh, the answer is for Fermi Lipton. For example, if you take uh, if you take uh, um, a spin half and a single channel that is optimally spin on the effect for spin half, okay, you are going to find that your tunneling conductance, which is again a global property, is going to scale as voltage square, okay, away from the zero uh, as a function of voltage, x one voltage. What does that mean? And but that this behavior is exactly same as for standard uh, standard electrons without the input. Okay, so so essentially what it means is that these single channel stuff or optimally string conductor physics is going to give rise to uh, going to give rise to uh, Fermi liquid like gate. However, if you take a spin half and you have two channels, for example, you are going to see a completely different behavior of tunneling conductance because what Affleck showed is that over string on the systems where you need multiple channels, for example, if you have two channels of electrons and a spin half, then it's like over string because k by 2 is 1 in that case, which is greater than spin half, s is half. Then the ground state turns out to be a very, uh, very interesting non Fermi liquid. Okay. So, and its behavior is completely different from standard uh, weakly interacting fermion system. For example, where uh, this G of B goes as square root of. Okay. Um, so, the conductance scales as square root of voltage at low energies. Now, the point is that for multi channel condo effect to occur, there should be at least two channels if you have a spin half. And therefore, this is not so easy to find because one of the requirements of this multi channel condo effect is that the channels cannot talk to each other. Okay. If they do, then this, they essentially spoil this effect. Okay, for reasons I'm not going to get into. So you really need a situation where the two channels do not talk to each other in a system and it's not such an easy thing to get. So this multi-channel combo effect and over has been largely a theoretical constant. There are not many physical systems which give rise to this. And okay, so okay, let me skip this. However, what I'm going to show now is some experimental data in graphene where this, there is a possibility that this kind of unconventional signatures um, can occur. And this was taken from Hori Monohan's group in Stanford, where they did some STM experiment where cobalt impurity, which has a spin half, is doped into is put on graphene. Okay. So what they do is that they have this graphene sheet and then they sprinkle these cobalt impurities on top of graphene. Now, they do not really know or they cannot really control where the cobalt atom sits in this graphene sheet, but they can figure this out where it has gone and sat by putting this SCM image. Okay, So they can image the impurities a posteriori, that is after the cobalt atoms have settled in, and they can find out you know, where um, where it has sat. So this for you is an STM topography of pure graphene sheet. This is a picture that you get from STM. And you see that if you zoom into this, you can really see this uh, uh, you know, construction of this graphene hexagons and stuff. And this picture is, uh, this thing is one nanometer. Okay, so this is a leg scale. That you have. And the height that you put in is the height of the STM tip from the graphene um, you know, substrate. And what is real, what I find, I always find really amazing, and I'm glad that I'm not an experimental physicist for this reason, is that these people are so you know smart and good with their hands and of course machine technology that they can control this height to order picometers, hundreds of picometers. And pico means 10 to the power minus 12, of course, and uh, you know that is really something phenomenal. Okay. So uh, okay. So what Hari Monohan did is to sort of look into this graphene sheet, and this is a weld of graphene sheet, which is 250 MeV. Uh, so the electron is very uh, highly doped, and uh, they were looking into this same data at 4 Kelvin. 
So what they find is a bimodal spectra. What does that mean? Whenever the so they could figure out the position of these impurities. So whenever this impurity is sitting at the center, they found that they have a swelled of V behavior. Okay, what they call as a two-channel condo effect. Okay, uh, and wherever whenever the impurity is sitting at the uh, on a side, they find that they have a single channel condo effect and a V squared behavior. So that's their experimental data. Now, why is this the case? So in the previous class, what we found out, uh, in the previous lecture, what I told you is that whenever there is a scattering uh, from an impurity in this graphene, if the sc scattering center, which is this impurity, sits on the hexagon center, then it cannot connect between K and K prime values of graphene. Okay, so if I go back a little bit, so uh, okay, so position of the impurity, if the atom is at the center of the hexagon because of this hexagonal symmetry, and because of these phase factors, you can see that uh, it doesn't really contribute. Uh, the intervalley scattering that you have essentially vanishes. Okay? So it really doesn't contribute much to. What does that mean? It means in the context of condo effect that if an impurity is sitting at the center of the hexagon, then scattering from it cannot scatter an electron from the k value to the k prime value. And therefore, the electrons in the k and the k prime value can act as independent channels for uh, screening the electron, this impurity screen. Okay? And therefore, in that case, you have two channels corresponding to electrons from K and K prime value, and one impurity with spin hub, which means it's an over screen condo system. And uh, what Hering and Aron showed is that they can fit their data very well with this square root of D behavior out here. Okay. This is uh, G. So this is the condo, this is the scale where of energy where they expect to see the condo effect between the uh, physical temperature T and the condo temperature Tk. The condo temperature here was roughly close to, I think it was close to about 20 Kelvin or so when the uh, 16 Kelvin actually here. So when the calculation was done and the physical temperature was 4 Kelvin and that's the window out here. And if you try to fit in, uh, in this square, you see that this line is hardly a straight line, whereas if you try to fit in a square root of Hippie, you see a more or less straight line. From this, they concluded that they do have a two-channel condo effect out in their sample. So graphene, because of this scattering, uh, because of this quantum coherence which kills the scattering between K and K prime value, essentially uh, leads to realization of two-channel condo effect. But the impurity has to sit at the center of the hexagon. Now, if the impurity doesn't sit on the center of the hexagon, if it sits on the top of a side, what happens is the following. You see, now the electron from the K value may come, scatter from the impurity and go to the K prime value. So there is an effective coupling through the impurity between the K and the K prime value. And as a result, what happens is that you have single channel condo effect because the K and the K prime values are not independent channels anymore. And therefore, there you see the single channel, one CK effect, that is single channel control. So essentially what British group showed is that they did a statistic. So they uh, know the positions of these impurities. So they found that whenever they have an impurity, and there are many of them in their sample, although they are quite far apart. So whenever they have this impurity, essentially uh, on, on the graphene hexagon center, they found that the scaling exponent, that is this alpha, is close to 0.5, okay? And they have a distribution like this. And for any impurity which is, uh, you know, on top of uh, a graphene side or on the bonds, they'll find a EV square, okay, out here. And uh, they call it the pi condo, and they call it the zero condo. That's the experiment, what the experimentalists call it. But for us, it's the two-channel condo effect and the single-channel condo. And also, you see that they do a scaling for this two-channel condo effect here. They fit the tunneling conductance, okay? 
GV minus G at this temperature, uh, and they find this two channel scale. So, okay, so I'm going to, this is all that I wanted to tell you about Pondo effect in graphene. The important point is that, you know, because of this, because of the fact that it can impurity sits at the graphene center, it really doesn't, the impurity doesn't scatter conduction electrons from the K to the K prime valleys in graphene. Therefore, the electrons in the K and the K prime valley can act as two independent channels. And this gives rise to two channel condo effect. That's, uh, that's something which is interesting. And I would like to point out that this is a phenomenon which happens because there are Dirac electrons in graphene. Because this cancellation of scattering, one can show, is completely due to uh, the Dirac nature of the graphene quasi particles. Okay. So, so you see that you know Dirac equations has many ramifications, and since its inception in context of high energy physics, there have been many um, uh, there have been many consequences. Of it. But now, given this graphene and topological insulators that we have talked about in the last ten years or so, in, uh, well, not ten, fifteen years now, uh, in condensed matter, you can look at these Dirac electrons and in a setting where you can talk about interaction between these Dirac electrons and also their interactions with you know, things like strong magnetic field or uh, magnetic impurities or you know, transport or make transport junctions out of this. And each of these gives you some real new features which you normally don't see in uh, either in dealing with high energy physics Dirac electrons or with dealing with standard Schrodinger electrons in condensed matter fields. And that's why uh, this kind of things are so interesting to physicists. Okay. So I think I'm going to stop here. And this is what I wanted to tell you about graphing. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm going to take it. And after that, uh, after maybe a minute or two break, I'm going to start with topological insurance. So any questions? Uh, okay, if there are no questions, then uh, let me go over to my next presentation, which is on topological insulators. Okay, and uh, let me try to see uh, where this is going. So let me see if I can draw that up. Yeah. Okay, so uh, okay, so now that we have known graphene, uh, so what happens is that we have essentially, you know, this graphene electrons, and why they are interesting because there were uh, the this is a topological aspect to it in the sense that at, if you take an electron around the k value near the Dirac point, you can show that you know that's going to have a Bailey phase of 2 pi as you circle around the Dirac point because Dirac points are like vortices in you know, standard uh, superconductors, uh, standard uh, language. Okay, they are vortices in momentum space and therefore you pick up a phase of 2 pi. Now, once people understood this, they want notice that there are always two of these Dirac points, and this means that if I you know really crumpled the graphing sheet or did something terrible to it. In principle, I can take these two Dirac points around K and K prime value and annihilate them. Okay, because one of them has a singularity with quantum number one, and the other one has a singularity with quantum number minus one. That's your K and K prime point. Because if you calculate the Bailey phase of an electron which is circling around this, you would find that it picks up a phase of 2 pi when it goes around the Dirac point in K value. And a minus two pi when it goes around the Dirac point in uh, K prime. Value. Now, of course, in realistic graphene, you never do this, but in principle, you can do it. And therefore, because some arbitrary perturbations can destroy these topological properties, these are typically graphene is classified as a weak topological insulator. These are uh, topo these are topological as, uh, substances where 
your topology is not entirely protected by symmetry. An analog of this would be a vortex anti vortex pair in a superconductor, where if they are far apart and if you make local measurements, you are going to see the property of a vortex or an anti vortex. But you know, if you sort of give something to your superconductor so that these two come close together and annihilate, then you are not going to see any topological properties at all. Uh, same thing happens in graphene in momentum space. In fact, it turns out that if you keep changing the uh, the hopping of these graphene electrons and make them anisotropic, in the extreme anisotropic limit, this topology goes away. This never happens in natural graphene, and so people really assume constantly with this much. But in principle, this is an example of a weak topological And once people understood this, people started asking, you know, is there anything called a strong topological insulator? In the sense that uh, where I would have this topological material, where no matter what I do, at least in the weak perturbation regime, I'm not going to destroy that topology. And the answer to that leads us to a host of new materials, and one of them is this topological instruments. Okay. So with this intro introduction, let me start with this topological instrument. But before that, let me just ask you what do we understand, you know, as uh, when we say insulators. Okay. I mean, typical high school uh, physics uh, tells you that anything like a piece of wood or this table on which my laptop is. Or you know any even furniture I have in my room here are all examples of insulators because these typically are classified in our 12th standard as classes of solids which have high electrical resistance. And you know, and don't try this at home. If you essentially keep uh, uh, you know draw an electric wire from your home connection and put it across a wooden plank. Uh, you are not going to conduct current through. Okay. So these are things with very high electrical resistance, and it's not easy to pass current through. Okay. But however, insulators are much more complicated and physics-wise much more beautiful objects. And over the last, uh, I would say, 70 or 80 years, people came to realize that there are many classes of insulator and there is a rich classification. The first class is that it's called band insulators. And here, the energy gap which leads to this insulating property arises out of the electron's interaction with the lattice potentials. So you know that in, um, um, so we all know that, you know, in a solid, you have this, um, you have these ions, okay, which are the nuclei of these uh, atoms which comprises the solid. And they form a background positive charge potential, and which is a periodicity. Okay, and a classic example of modeling such periodic charge uh, charge object is the chronic penny model, which we solve in our quantum mechanics course. Okay, uh, which which has a uh, large number of um, of uh, you know periodic large number of period square well potentials in one dimension, and we know that in those cases, and if you take an electron in the presence of such chronic chronic penny potential, or in case of this solid. You know that there appears forbidden regions, that is, there are regions in energy space where there is no electron states. So those are the band gaps, and these band gaps separate regions which are of allowed electron, where you can have electronic states, those are the allowed regions, and those form the bands. The bands which are, and once we understand this, we keep filling these bands starting from the lowest one. And uh, in insulators, what happens is that you exhaust all your electrons when you build up the nth band, and the n plus one nth band is completely empty. Which means your Fermi energy is directly in between these two bands, and therefore there is a gap around the Fermi energy. Now, the other situation could have been when this Fermi energy is in the middle of a band, which then means that uh, there is no gap because there are allowed states around the Fermi energy. Okay, those would be metals. However, here we are talking about insulators, and there the band gap arises because of uh, the electron's interaction with the lattice potential. The second class are the Anderson insulators, where if you have uh, 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 where this non-conductivity or insulating behavior of the solids happens 
because the wave function gets localized. Okay. And therefore, what happens is that uh, the electrons simply cannot move across the solids. And that happens because if you put in impurities, what Anderson showed is that the uh, wave function due to scattering from those impurity potentials can get localized. Now, these two are examples of single body physics, where a single electron can, can get scattered from the impurities or can interact with this lattice potential. And therefore, you know, they lead to this kind of insulating behavior. There is a third class, which, which where this insulating behavior happens because of interaction between the electrons. Okay. Now there is a simple way to understand this, and the simple way to understand this is that imagine just two lattice sites and uh, two electrons. Okay. Now, in, if these electrons do not interact with each other, then you could put two electrons on one lattice site or two electrons on two different lattice sites. And in between, the electrons are simply going to sort of make a superposition of these two states, and you know they are going to sort of travel back and forth between the two lattices because that minimizes their kinetic energy. Okay, and therefore that's your ground state. However, if the interaction, the if the electrons interact with themselves and they interact pretty really strongly, then the two electrons will not like to be on the same lattice side because that costs a huge interaction energy and therefore that they are going to be localized on the two different lattices, uh, lattice sites. Okay. And this gives you an example of how electron-electron interaction can localize electrons and a mini-body version of this gives rise to insulators what are called Mott insulators. We are going to talk about this Mott insulator in the insulators in context of bosons when we discuss this uh, you know, cold atom stuff in the later part of the lecture, but I'm not going to do it today. Uh, but over the class of, over the last 50 or 70 years, you know, a large class of theorists who works on strongly correlated materials concentrate on these mock insulators because they are more interesting many body systems. However, the presence of these topological insulators essentially showed that's a realization that has dawned over the last 15 years or so, is that 3D band insulators can be very interesting objects and they can have classification schemes depending on the topology of this ground state wave function. The topology of its bands, so to speak. Okay. So those are the topological insulators and I'm going to sort of discuss this in details. To discuss the topology of this, it's best to go back to this Hall effect, which we discussed, okay? but let's go over this once again. You see that this Hall effect essentially comprises of putting a magnetic field on a 2D electron gas. And we saw that in the bulk, these electrons essentially have cyclotron orbits. So they are, lo they are localized, you know, they just go in circles like this. Whereas in the stage, you have the skipping orbits, which gives the direction to electron motion. And therefore, you have current carrying states because the electrons can move in one direction. The quantum picture of this is that you have localized Landau levels in the pulp, okay, and a delocalized A states, which uh, has some density of states at the Fermi energy. So these states are chiral, and the chirality essentially comes because you have broken time reversal invariance giving a direction to the current, and that is done by putting in a magnetic field. The direction of the magnetic field controls the way in which these electrons go. Okay, so that's the picture, a uh, very, you know, uh, handling picture for quantum, integer quantum Hall effect. In so once people understood this, they tried to figure out, can you do this with, uh, you know, uh, with essentially without putting in a magnetic field, without breaking time reversal in this. Okay, and after some search, it turned out that spin orbit interaction in solids essentially gives rise to that kind of stuff. Now, how does this happen? Now, uh, what happens is the simplest way to look at this is that imagine that you have a Hamiltonian, okay, in solids, where you have this um, p square over 2 m, uh, basically, uh, you know, quadratic dispersion, but you have an LZ and SZ, okay? 
And this is something that, uh, so the spin orbit coupling occurs through coupling of the Z component of the orbital momentum with the Z component of the spin momentum. Now, since LZ is X times PY minus Y times PX, okay, so that's a standard um, this thing. You can massage these expressions a little bit and you can show that this, this spin orbit interaction effectively is like, to, uh, is like a magnetic field because this x times p y now acts as a vector potential because p connects to x, p y connects to x, and so on. And uh, but because of the presence of this s z, the direction of this effective magnetic field that is coming out because of this spin orbit coupling essentially has opposite directions for opposite spins. Okay. So now you can think of an integer quantum Hall effect, but one for spin up and spin down. So again, with that thing, you have bulk levels, okay, which are again going to be localized because it's all electrons, you know, spin up electrons in one direction of the magnetic field. So I'm undergoing cyclotron motion and spin down electron showing another, uh, seeing another thing, undergoing again cyclotron motion. And therefore, you know, these are localized bands uh, level, bulk levels for up and down. However, there are skipping orbits at the edge, and that tells you that there will be now two states, one corresponding to up electrons, spin up electrons, and the other corresponding to spin down electrons, which are going to sort of cross the Fermi level. Now, therefore, you have an opposite pair of, uh, pair of A states carrying opposite spin and in moving an opposite chiralic. That is the moving opposite directions. So you see that here you have time reversal invariance, which is preserved. So TRS time reversal symmetry is preserved, and therefore, you know there is no inherent direction because corresponding to every electron which moves in the up space, you can find a time reverse counterpart which moves in the down direction. So right moving electrons always have a corresponding left moving electron. With their spin split, which it must because these electrons must be time reversal counterparts of each other. So, therefore, you have zero charge current because you have equal number of electrons moving up and down. However, there is a net spin current which is generated because up electrons moving to the right and down electrons moving to the left together constitutes a, constitutes a net spin transfer uh, to the right. Okay. Net spin up transfer to the right. So these states they do not carry charge current, but they do carry spin currents. Okay. So uh, and this phenomenon where the spin orbit coupling gives rise to a quantum Hall effect kind of thing is called a spin quantum Hall. It's typically instigated by spin orbit interaction. Okay. So any questions regarding this? You know, is the Analogy to this uh, interior quantum Hall effect theorem. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so there are two edge states here, right? That's right. And and the claim is that uh, they do not interact. Oh yeah, I'm coming to that. Uh, just let me uh, address that uh, in one second. Uh, but uh, any other questions regarding the edge states or uh, this bus test that you have? Uh, sir, yeah. So, are they also uh, the, the same spatial position? Uh, these edge states. Oh, they are localized at the edge of the sample because the skipping orbits are localized at the. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, uh, these states are not separated uh, spatially in any manner. They basically are both at the edge of the. You mean these states? The two. Uh, the edge states. The edge states only. Yeah. Uh, they are not separate. No, not to the of uh, this effective theory. No. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? I think there is some problem with the sound system. Uh, uh, so, Orun, if you want, you can type in the chat box and I'm going to try to look into this, okay? Uh, let me see, not, nothing in the chat box here, but when it comes, I'm going to look into it, okay? Okay, so now 
let me try to address the question that why these A states do not interact with each other. The reason again is uh, actually uh, the fact that one of these A states carries spin up and the other one carries spin down. Therefore, if you have an impurity or any potential which essentially reflects, uh, it takes one electron uh, from the up states to another electron to the down states, then clearly they have to leave the spin of the electron. Okay? And this can only happen if you have magnetic impurities. But magnetic impurities we know uh, does not preserve time reversal invariance. So as long as you have time reversal invariance preserved in your system, you really cannot interact, you have an interaction between these two edges. Okay, so okay, so there is something in the chat box I'm going to address that, but let me finish this first. So, uh, and this is why, unless you have a time reversal symmetry breaking perturbation in your system, these A states cannot be mixed with each other and therefore they are, uh, they, they do not interact. Okay, uh, however, there is something to be said here, that is, uh, time reversal symmetry is the symmetry which gives a protection to these A states and this is one of the first examples that we see where uh, preservation of a symmetry gives protection to a bunch of states in your system. Okay, so let me address the question now in the chat box. Oops, sorry, how do I access the chat box? Okay, ah, here it is. So let me see. Uh, is spin orbit coupling always due, due to only LZ and LZ? What happens to their X and Y component? Oh, that's a good question. So the point is that you can take the X and the Y components as well, and you can do a more serious computation taking the X and the Y component. However, this simple picture that I talked to you about, that is more easily visible if you just have the LZ component. The basic point, so what happens is that the basic physics remains the same, but details change. Okay, so that's what happens. So this you can try to look at actually. Because uh, if I have a 2D sample and then I can preserve my, then clearly my LZ is only in the, two, so my L is only in the 2D plane and it can only have a Z component. Okay. Uh, so there you are fine, and um, you can you can try to see that you know that's the only term. But for three D samples, of course, this is not the case, and you want to do a more careful analysis. So, Krishnan, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. So, so in this case, then if you make basically a, a measurement of the edge current, if you cannot resolve the spin, then there is no charge transport on the edge, right? That's right. Okay. So, so that's you, that's but, but, but it is possible to make, uh, in some sense, you can make spin resolved current measurements or something to detect this uh, spin quantum quality. Well, okay. One of the things that people often say is that, uh, so, uh, so I haven't told this, but let me tell you this. So, uh, you see that uh, in the uh, quintessential, you know, pristine spin all effect sample, you are going to have an equal population of this red and the green level because everything under mm -hmm. the Fermi energy is. Occupied and everything above is empty. Okay. Uh, so now, if I apply a Zeeman field to this system, okay, then clearly I'm going to populate the up level more compared to the down level because Zeeman effect will favor population populating the up level. Now that essentially means that you are going to have more up electrons compared to down, and that's going to give you a charge current. Okay. So. One of the ways to measure this is through charge measurement is that a magnetic probe gives rise to an electric signal. You know, and that's the whole hallmark of spin orbit coupling. And that's one way you can test this uh, spin hole. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir. Questions? Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir, yeah. So basically, you have mentioned that this uh, material needs to have some sort of a spin orbit interaction. That's right. So the earlier point that you made about uh, interaction possible only if there are magnetic impurities. I was wondering if this material itself uh, could induce some sort of spin flipping. 
uh, to I mean the toxins are material. This material, it's uh, you choose this spin quantization axis such that this is it times is it? Okay, it's a two D material. So okay, okay. Two D terms. Oh, because I've uh, read in literature that uh, so uh, to induce this kind of a spin uh, backscattering, people use uh, spin orbit coupled insulators. Sure. In, so, okay. So, let me again, uh, let me get into the details. So, this kind of coupling that I was talking about is like a Dresselhaus coupling, okay, in the literature. And that Dresselhaus coupling typically does not lead to spin flip. On the other hand, there is another type of spin orbit coupling called the Rajva coupling, which is, which involves the spin uh, flip scattering. So, this kind of spin quantum hole effect, if you have a large Rajva term, then this goes away, okay? Because spin is not a good quantum number anymore, and uh, your your A states essentially hybridize with each other because you have this Rajba kind of terms. But if you don't have Rajba, if you just have this allows, then this is it, okay? Okay, okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah, okay, good. So, um, any other questions? Okay, if not, let me get into the topological insulators. Okay, so let me define this and then I'm going to do some algebra uh, with this. And uh, so, so this was spin hole effect in 2D. And once people understood this in 2D, people started to, wanted to figure out is that is there anything like this which can happen in 3D? And this is a bit different from the standard 2D stuff because in 2D, you know, because it's a even number of spatial dimension, you can define these things called the uh, uh, things called charm number, which is basically this very phase kind of thing, okay, for bands. But in 3D insulators, in, real, in 3D things, you cannot really define charm numbers and stuff like that, okay. So the classification scheme, even if you had topological properties, was not immediately obvious. And then these gentlemen, you know, uh, Liam Fu and Charlie Kim, Liam Balance and Joel Moore, and Rahul Rai, they, uh, they wrote these papers all uh, at the same go. And as it happens with journals, you know, and because Rahul was just a graduate student, uh, APS journals clearly said that, look, whatever you are talking is clearly nonsense and there cannot be anything like this, so we are not going to publish your paper. So Rahul had to wait for two long years after you know his archive submission was cited profusely, and he was considered as one of the three groups uh, which uh, proposed this idea. Before uh, APS journal said, oh, "Okay, well, fine. Okay, submit it. We are going to accept it, and so on." Okay, so that's what happened. But uh, okay, so all said and done. So what they showed is that there is indeed a classification scheme. So there are these topology and there are topological properties of band in the bulk, which can lift, which uh, does not change the insulating properties of these solids. They are still insulated in the band, but the gap, uh, they, they lead to gapless A states at the electron surface. And this essentially leads to what we know as uh, topological insulators. Now, just as in 2D systems, these gapless A states essentially are uh, two dimensional, uh, of, sorry, one dimensional uh, states with some chirality, which means that they are moving in X and Y direction or Y direction depending on the age. Okay, they are one dimensional object with chirality. You are in the two dimensional object with chirality, and Dirac electrons are essentially. Uh, perfect for that. And indeed, I'm going to discuss experiments where they have to, where people have shown that it's really this two-dimensional chiral Dirac electron which appears in the surface. Now, I don't have a good simple analytical proof why this have to be due, these A states have to be Dirac electrons. However, uh, you know, it, 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 people show that these are typically fermionic states and in two-dimension fermionic states, which have chirality and spin properties, which is required in this kind of things, which are going to become clear when I talk about this um, stuff. 
Uh, there are very, I mean, I don't know of any other theory other than Dirac theory in two dimension which gives rise to this kind of thing. Uh, probably there are some things, but typically experiments show that they are not realistic. Okay. So now, but the interesting thing is that thus uh, in graphing, what we have shown is that there are Dirac electrons, but the Dirac degrees of freedom were were single spins. Okay. So they are not real spins of the electrons. Here, as we show that the Dirac electron comes with degrees of freedom, which are the real spins. So the two by two Dirac matrix that you write down in 2D now uh, corresponds to up and down spins and not single spins of these objects. Okay. And here is a picture of this kinetic Dirac cones that you see uh, in this kind of systems. Okay. So uh, these are topological insulators, okay? And I'm going to now uh, sort of classify these two, so uh, try to see what classifies these topological insulators, okay? And, uh, but before that, is there any question regarding the, uh, this part? Okay then. So, Hello, sir. Yeah, sure. Uh, sir, can you please make the comment on Dirac electron that you just made? Please repeat it again. Uh, what do you want to know exactly? So the, like you said that the this electron has to be Dirac electron, the surface it has to be Dirac, 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 Dirac spinners in 2D. Okay, so they have to be chiral stuff. So the electrons have to have a certain chirality, which I'm going to define in a moment. Okay, and all I'm saying is that I don't know, and that's not a very big statement because there might be other stuff. But I don't know of many theories for two plus one dimensional electrons, which are chiral and which are not Dirac. Uh, that's statement number one. And the second thing is that experiments typically show that predictions made, assuming that these are Dirac electrons, hold. Okay, so that's the statement that I uh, Okay, sir. Okay, so let's come to the classification of these Dirac electrons, and I'm going to talk about this classification starting from the two-dimensional spin hole effect stuff. So the first part of this classification which I'm going to do is to cons is, is going to concern the spin hole effect systems. It's a 2D system now. It's 2D system now. Okay. And in 2D system we know that what we have is uh, so so in 2D system once I have a band which has a wave function psi I can write down a Berry phase corresponding to that, which we have looked into, which is just the gradient of this wave function in momentum space, superposed uh, or overlapped with the wave function itself. That's your Berry potential. And then you can find out a Berry curvature and therefore a geometric phase. Okay? This gives me an integer which classifies every band in a 2D solve. Okay. So with this in mind, let me try, oops, sorry. Uh, let me try to get into the classification scheme for the 2D stuff. And after this, I'm going to stop and I'm going to look into the 3D classification in the next lecture. Because otherwise it's going to be too, oops, sorry. Okay, so now consider a system which has time universal symmetry. And there are bands. Okay? Each of these bands has a momentum dispersion, which I'm going to call E of K. And because there are this two dimension, uh, this time reversal symmetry, we know that there is something called Kramer's degeneracy. That is, the up spin and the down spin bands, they cannot be one and same. Kramer's degeneracy tells you that they must be different bands. Okay? So you have a spin up band and a spin down band here. Now, uh, the other thing is that each of these bands are going to be classified by a Berry curvature, which I'm going to talk about. But before going into this Berry curvature, let me come into this time reversal symmetry of these bands. So imagine that you have a upspin band and a downspin band. Then we know that E up of k and E down of minus k, because the state psi up k and psi down of minus k are time reversal counterparts of each other because if you just apply a time reversal uh, operation on psi up k you get psi 
k goes to minus k up goes to down under time inversal. So you get time of uh, psi of minus k and down. And if your system has time reversal symmetry, then the energy of the up electron at momentum k must be equal to energy of the down momentum at minus k. That's what time reverse symmetry means because you know, under time reversal symmetry operation, physical properties of the system, such as the electron energy, cannot change. Okay, of course, states can change, but the energy can. Now, what, what does this mean? Now, imagine that you have this up and down spin bands, which are called Kramer pairs, because they are time reversal counterparts of each other. And let's say this cross at some particular momentum, which I call a time reverse invariant momentum for reasons which is going to become clear. But let's say that they cross at k now, okay, some k equal to k. Then, clearly at this point, energy of the up band and the down band at k equal to k naught are identical. But I know that the energy of the down band at k equal to k naught must be equal to energy of the up band at k equal to minus k. Which means that energy of the up band at k naught and minus k naught must be the same. Unless there is a flat band, this puts very severe restriction on K0. And the restriction is that K0 must be minus of itself, which in a continuum system means that K0 must be zero. But in a lattice system, because two momenta which is separated by Q, that is a reciprocal lattice vector, are exactly the same, this K0 can be Q by two. So this also tells you that the Kramer pairs, that is the band pair, which are essentially, you know, time reverse counterparts of each other, may only cross at values of momentum, which is either zero or Q by two, but Q is the reciprocal that is like. So that's the first statement I want to make. And this is very important to understand uh, in, the, in this classification scheme. So I'm going to take uh, a pause and ask that if this part is clear as of now. Yes, no. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, sir, uh, <laughs> is this audible? So like Time reversal uh, invariant, you are saying like the system is here as time reversal invariant. So suppose like in time reversal symmetry, when it's break like B the time changes to minus. Uh, so can you speak a little louder, please? I can't hear you. Not audible. Audible or not? Yeah, now I can hear you. Audible or not? Yeah, now it's fine. So, okay. So it changes momentum to minus uh, minus the momentum i to minus i. But how will it affect the spin orbit coupling, like the breaking of the time reversal symmetry? Oh, uh, the spin orbit coupling is invariant because L and S both changes sign. So L dot S remains the same. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, let me quickly go through this. Uh, we are getting late. So essentially, uh, now consider a given band, which has momentum k and spin sigma. Then corresponding to this, I can always define a Berry potential by taking my parameter to be the quasi-momentum in k space. And therefore, what I can do is to define a topological index, which is 1 by 2 pi, times the Berry curvature, which the, which the Berry phase, which the band which an electron picks up as it moves in this band in k space okay so where dk is some on 2 d 2 d and 2 d k x k y space and this n sigma is typically called the charm number corresponding to the band this can be zero or some integers okay depending on the structure of this band now when two such bands cross say for example you know this band crossing okay it turns out that their charm number can change because, uh, well, the reason it can change is that it passes to a singularity because you see that this is almost like a Dirac point out here because two bands really cross at a given point. And here the charm number is ill defined because you know it's exactly at the crossing point of two uh, wave functions. This one can show. 
formally, but uh, because the, you are passing through a singularity, your churn number can change, and that change will always occur in integers. So, for example, n1 and n2 essentially can go to n1 plus delta n1 and n2 plus delta n2, where this delta n could be 1, 2, etc. It's all integers essentially. There's a total churn number of all bands. Okay, uh, and here in this counting schemes, and if I count a band, I'm not going to count its time inverse counterparts as well. You see, therefore, this total leads to a number, the total churn number leads to a number which is either odd or even. It cannot be, uh, you know, because the ch total change in churn number is totally zero. The crossings cannot change this, the even or the odd nature of this churn number, no matter what crossings we have. Now, these crossings can be of two types. The first one is that two pairs of bands, which are not Kramer pairs, they can cross at a given momentum k. But if that happens, there is also an analogous crossing at a given momentum minus k, which is time inverse counterpart of the first. Okay, and the change in charm numbers cancel. So those kind of crossings really don't contribute. The other type of crossings that happens do contribute to a change in char number, but it doesn't contribute to change in odd or even nature of the char numbers. Okay. So if I take a sum over the char number modulo 2, because I'm looking at the parity of this char number really, whether it's odd or even, I could have a 0 or 1. And if you have this to be 1, okay, uh, then it's completely different from uh, 0. The reason is this. So suppose now we consider a uh, uh, insulator, which is just only one band. Well, uh, one band, which doesn't intersect with any other band. Okay. And which is a very garden variety of wave functions as that is very phase is zero. That's the simplest type of insulator that you can have. And there clearly this churn number is zero, and therefore you know your your i is just zero mod two. Okay. So therefore. Trivial insulators, which can be connected to this kind of insulators by some manipulation or by change of parameters and stuff like that, they are called trivial insulators. Whereas if you have i equal to 1 mod 2, uh, then this class of insulators cannot really be changed by just change of parameters to these trivial insulators. Okay? And they are called uh, topolo topological insulators in two dimension and spin quantum Hall systems are examples of topological insulators in two dimension. And in the next uh, lecture, what we are going to see is to how to generalize this definition in three dimension and that's what Rahul and others do. Okay. So I think I'm going to stop here for today and take questions. Anything which is unclear? Anything? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, uh, the, the the number that you lastly defined, if it is zero or one, does uh, the, if it is one, does it mean that the two spin bands cross, or it is uh, cannot be said? Spin bands will cross at least once somewhere or an odd number of times. Uh, oh, in 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 that sense, uh, you say that they are different from in trivial insulators, right? Yes. So you can look at it at some another way. So suppose you know there is an odd number of crossing between these spin bands. Okay. See, yes. now I change parameters and then the crossings come together and annihilate. So when the dust settles at the end of the day, because it takes two to annihilate this, because it has a Dirac like structure, okay, uh, there would be at least one left. So an odd number of crossing of spin bands can never be coupled perturbatively to zero or even number of spin band crossings. Okay, and those are in a different class altogether. Uh, okay. Okay. Limit limit dx tends to zero. I'm sorry. Hello. Was there a question? Probably not. Okay. Okay, there are two comments on the chat box, so let me try to get to those. 
Oh, sorry, let me just try to. If you want, I can read for you. No, no, got it, got it. Okay, the first question was, of course, what I had. So, as you said, Dressler SOC is there in your explanation. Then, what happened at Rajba SOC? Well, if you, as I said, you know, if I increase the strength of my Rajba coupling, then after a critical strength, this spin hull effect goes away. This was seen by Kane and others a uh, long time back in 2006 when they were discussing this spin quantum hull. So, Krishnan, just uh, question if there is. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in, in this last explanation using band crossing and uh, this modulo 2 argument, the, the details of whether you have a, 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 a trivial or uh, this spin quantum hall effect seems to depend on the details of the band structure. Really, it will, is uh, that correct? No, that, no, that's really the point. It doesn't depend on the band structure. The reason is that this band structure gives rise to specific forms of U uh -huh. and E. You know, right. I have never used the specific forms anywhere mm. except for saying that you must have a topological index associated to it. Okay. 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 So, so, so that is the whole beauty of it. It's okay. robust enough that you don't really need so, you know the nitty-gritty details of a right. uh, of a typical sample. Right. So you could just think of it as having some wave function with some topological properties right. that is protected by some symmetry, and then you can work from there. Right. So, so, so maybe what, what, what was sort of my, uh, where the question was going was basically the, the very, uh, qualitative semi-classical argument you gave for the spin quantum hall effect. Yeah. That, uh, kind of, you have to qualify it by this picture, right? Because in that case, the topology doesn't enter so obviously. Uh, uh, actually the topology does enter because it enters in the you see, the point is that when I said this uh, signal effect, I uh -huh. went, I mapped it into an integer uh, quantum hall effect for uh -huh. upspin and downspins. Right. And the conductivity of integer quantum hall effect uh -huh. is a baby phase. Ah, ah, okay. Okay, okay. so that's where the connection that's is. Where. Okay, nice, okay. nice. So it's all the classification through this baby phase kind of stuff, and uh, that's where the connection is. So, so basically, in this case, there will be essentially no edge current if you do not have uh, uh, no edge charge current. There will be edge a edge spin current. Oh yeah. no! What I meant is, in, if it was a trivial uh, insulator, there oh. would also not be any. Uh, you will not see that effect, right? So no, actually, that is not entirely true. The statement okay. more is that, so suppose I have a trivial insulator, mm -hmm. I can always have an even number of up sets, up, sorry, up spin sets and an even number of up spin down sets. I see, I see. Okay, so what it means is that it's not going to enjoy that topological protection in the sense that if you just uh, probe it with some little bit of impurities or something like that, Okay. these up spin sets are going to hybridize among themselves and form a gap and you lose the current. And so does the down. Okay. But it's okay. only when there is an odd number, right. no matter what hybridization takes place, unless you break this universal symmetry, mm -hmm. one A state is at least left out. Okay. okay. So it's really the topological robustness which is important. All right. Makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. At some level, you know, this is really the statement that. Uh, Topology doesn't distinguish between your uh, cup and uh, you know a very complicated object with one hole. Okay. Uh, yeah. It is exactly the same. It cannot really tell you about the details of currents and everything in uh, a trivial insulator. Right. It just tells right. you that in a non-trivial case there would be something. What that something is requires details of calculation. Right. Right. Okay. So that's so, so there is, seems to be one more question or doubt in the yeah uh, yeah. yeah. In the chat box? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me try to get to the chat box. Sorry. <laughs> uh, one more basic doubt regarding the gas nomenclature. Uh, okay, this is technical. I think honeycomb is the right thing. Uh, if you have a hexagon thing with two elliptical structure, Two, sorry, two uh, 
point in its structure, then probably it's called a honeycomb. I don't really remember it at the top of my head, but that's what my recollection is. So I just wanted to make a comment that uh, I'm glad that you mentioned Rahul Roy's story because uh, he was a I I knew him from Hamilton and uh, he was rooming with me for a bit also. It's quite it's quite uh, interesting. No, no, actually Rahul and I used to talk a lot in those days because uh, you know in um, so just before he wrote this, his paper came out in June 2006, and we ah. were going through a collaboration in March. I see. I, I just came back to Calcutta at that point, but before that, I was in Toronto uh, you know, ah, yeah. with yeah. Uh, your advisor and my <laughs> friend. Yes. Uh, and, and and see, the thing is that uh, at that point, Rahul was in uh, Mac, so we used to talk a lot. Right. And uh, this discussion was there, and uh, it was at that point, you know, he, after this Zoom paper, was really very, very depressed at some point because right. exactly. he thought that he did something substantial, which was right. absolutely correct. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, the community. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it was very, because it was in McMaster that he was actually just after, it was his first postdoc, and it was during this time that he was really, it was considering for like three years when he was in McMaster yeah. the archive. Yes. It was very painful. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I guess there are no other questions, so we can probably stop. Uh, okay.